Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, July 5th, 2024, let's get into it. First topic of the video that I wanted to discuss is my lack of faith, or my, I guess my faith in the fact that the Democrats are going to cheat like hell on the election. Now, are they going to be able to cheat enough to um, turn the results? I think so. And the reason why I think so is we've got 30 million illegal aliens that are going to be voting in the election or somewhere thereabouts. Okay, and my biggest concern is having the Democrat, Greg Abbott, in charge of Texas. Greg Abbott has let 1.5 million illegal aliens into the state of Texas. From what I saw and what I spoke to men about, I'm like, how, how's no one talking about this? This is right in your face, and no one says a word. It's shocking. Well, and you were in te you know, Texas, Governor Abbott, who professes to be you know, anti-illegal immigration and all of this, so this. Hundreds of these facilities are on his soil. Where is Governor Abbott, product of the World Economic Forum? Governor Abbott, an enemy of the United States. Where is he on this story? Oh, he's everything with him is theater. I'm going to shut the border down. No, no, sir. You put National Guard on 47 acres of 1,250 miles of the border you share with Mexico, and then your National Guard got embarrassed and got run over. Run over. You've done nothing. You have almost 200 of these facilities in Texas. You got to understand, you're looking at about 500 children a day are coming across the border. 500 a day. That's what we know about. That's just what we arrest or give themselves up to the border patrol. This number of 600,000 is easily a million, a million and a half. This, pro this problem is so enormous. I believe in a decade, someone of some means and intellect is going to do a deep dive and they are going to come out with House of Horrors. Look, my, my source tells me, listen, I go into some of these facilities that are for infants and young children. He goes, I walk in there and it is as far as the eye can see cribs, just baby cribs. Oh my! And he God. says oh the noise, God. the noise of them crying and screaming. He said, quote, it's a house of horrors. America, wake up. It's happening in your nation. You, if you think, look, I'm you a imagine man. And he's housing them there. And I'm going to tell you, I've heard no evidence, no news, no broadcast that Texas is making sure that the illegal aliens are not getting onto the voter rolls. And I've explained to you in previous videos how that's taking place. That what the Biden administration is doing is they're, they're registering the illegal aliens with Social Security so that they have a number, and then they're using that number to get onto the voting rolls in all 50 states. Now, there was a rumor that Virginia may be trying to clean those illegal... I told you the only way to get the illegal aliens off of the, the rolls and the dead people and everybody else that the Democrats register to vote well, not vote, ballots, all the ballots that they can collect is, the, is to purge those databases and have everybody register with an ID. But that's not going to happen. So we are screwed. Now, if Texas goes blue, that's it. Trump, Ted Cruz, we lose the Senate. We lose the, the uh, presidency. And God help the United States, because with the Democrats in charge another four years, we could have six to... 60 million illegal aliens, and I imagine that most every MAGA Republican will be in a concentration camp. That didn't register to me until we went out to Floyd Bennett Field to look at the giant migrant center they created. So I'm driving there and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, Floyd Bennett, I've been here five, about eight years ago. This was, they had carnivals and it was beautiful. It was like a lower middle class neighborhood, but it was vibrant. And I'm driving around, I'm like, Oh my God, I've been here before. Oh my God, what happened? And I'm driving in the middle of this. It's like a wooded area with a river and there's a lot of camping. No, they took it over in the middle of nowhere and built it. it it's a FEMA camp. It has to hold between two and 4,000 people. But as you and I discussed in our prior time together, I didn't see two to 4,000 people there. I saw tens. 
I didn't see 500, 600, 700 workers that should be monitoring and working. I saw 10. So why is there a FEMA camp to hold thousands of illegal aliens and there's tens of illegal aliens in there? And it goes back to what we talked about before. You're building FEMA camps or detention facilities across the United States of America. For who? For dissidents. There's no one in there. <clears throat> Clayton, there's no one. Clayton, I drove by there. You have to go in. A, it's like a, a, a semicircle around it, right? And they have this buffer zone where you can't walk anywhere near the center. So you have to drive around. I would say the half, half circle of that drive around is three miles. Like that's how big the camp is to drive around. And I'm like, okay, I get on one end, I drive back around. I'm like, dear God, this place is huge. It's holding anywhere from two to 4,000 people. It was $28 million to build that. 28 million, probably with millions of dollars a month to maintain. And Clayton, there's no one in it. There's no one in it. And so yet they're why? taking over these hotels all throughout New York City clandestinely. So you don't even know they're there. Mm -hmm. All of from Times Square, all the way up to the Upper West Side. By the end of those four years, that's just my concern. So I had an argument with a, a buddy of mine. He came over for uh, July 4th uh, and, uh, and he said, no way, no way they register new legal immigrants to vote. And you know, he's pretty uh, conservative guy. I said, well, yes, they are, man. So he says, well, prove it to me, prove it to me. He's always, he says, show me the data, show me the data. So I said, well, I can't show you the data, but I'll show you a video. So I went back to a video on Redacted. It was about three days ago. Uh, I'll put the title up on, on the video. And I definitely check out the whole thing. Now, I'm just going to give you a clip from, uh, from the guy that was on there that was being interviewed. Uh, by, but let's watch that clip from him talking about the election. You can't release illegal aliens to the street. It's against the Immigration Nationality Act. You can't. It's against the law. But they do it. You can't stay in the country and, and try to get asylum. They allow you to do it. Parole. Parole is not what you think of state and local parole. Parole and immigration is very tightly. It's a it's a one on one, very, very restricted use of this. If I have somebody from Germany that needs to get uh, brain surgery or has some strange cancer that only a very small group of doctors in the world. Well, you can fly in, but you're, you, you have like a 10 day window and you fly out. Well, they took parole. They bastardized it. Now there's a million, 2 million, 3 million, 5 million. Asylum cases are now 4 million, 4 million cases backed up. Do you know how many asylum officers there are in America? There's less than 900. There's less than 900 that are adjudicating 4 million cases. Do you know that over five to six million people have already gone through the elite, the immigration system, seen the judge, been ordered to deport, and they refuse to leave? Five to six million that we know of. We live in a lawless society. There is no law. Everyone says, well, we have justice. You're a fool if you think there's any justice for anybody in America, unless you are exceptionally wealthy and powerful. Everyone else, you're on your own. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, it's a uh, big topic. It, it's it, a big it, topic. It is. Um, I'm just like, I, I cover so many stories. Now they're starting to blend in my mind. Didn't Republicans impeach my Yorkas and Senator Chuck Schumer of New York tabled it. He put it on the shelf and said, we're not going to, uh, try to remove this man from office. Yes, he did a, a parliamentary procedure that's never been done. But the Republicans did it by one vote, and they they milly mouthed it. And then what did what did McConnell do? Did he fight? Did any did Ted Cruz? Did any of those guys fight? No. This is all a dog and pony show. I want your audience to understand something. The, the Democrats are evil. I can't stand them. I'll just be honest. But I I'm equally disgusted with the Republicans. This is a uniparty issue. Look, I my career ran. Bill Clinton, George Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. I've seen everything. The only man that actually secured the border was President Trump, the greatest border president ever. He was within six to nine months of having a border completely secure. But you know what they didn't do? The Republicans had the House and Senate. Remember that? His first two years in office had everything. 
Do you know who wouldn't give them the money to build the fence? McConnell and Ryan, Republicans. The Republicans stopped the border wall. Look, let me make your audience has, has an understanding. Put this in context. At the end of Trump's term in office, we were arresting 500 to 600 people a day. I would get the 24-hour report. Five to 600. That's like a drip in your faucet. That's a nothing. And everyone was deported. No one was released. We were winning. We couldn't believe it. We were we, Morale was off the chart. Day one of Joe Biden, we went to five to 6,000 a day, released every last one of them. Do you know since Joe Biden has taken office to present day that he has arrested and released anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 a day? No. A day for almost four years straight. Do you, if, if you just allow me just 30 seconds to get, just put a picture because people don't, can't, Visualize what I'm talking about. In the beautiful Pasadena, California, you got the Rose Bowl, 100,000 people, 100,000 seat stadium. So I want you to envision what I'm saying. Right now, we're averaging somewhere 10,000. Let's just say 10,000. It's an easy number. So I open the I open the gates on the south side of the Rose Bowl, 10,000 a day for 10 days. I packed that stadium, just packed. You can't move. 65% to 70% of them are single adult military age men from China, Iran, Afghanistan, you name it. They're there. 30,000, 30% 30 are men, women, and children. Of those women and children, 20%, at least 80% of them are going to be raped and, and, and sexually assaulted. Then at midnight on the 10th day, I open the Northern Gate and I push them into America. But at the same time, I don't close my Southern Gate and I fill the Rose Bowl up and I do this over and over and over again for four solid years. Do you have a picture now what I'm talking about? Every 10 days, I'm not talking about the ones that are absconding. I'm just saying every 10 days, I push out 100,000 people into America. Every single 10 days. Oh my gosh. And, and nobody cares to stop it. <laughs> no, because they have, they have created a system that is so large, it's so entrenched, the NGOs in partnership with the federal government have created a conveyor belt, an assembly line, if you will, where millions of people, think about how hard it is. Think about, I've got a pen, 12 million of these pens. You know how hard it is to move 12 million pens? Now imagine 12 million people, the apparatus that's needed to move them, fly them, get them houses, hotels, new clothes, education, money. It's an enormous machine that has been built for over years. This, this happened prior to Biden coming into office. This is, you have, and I say this and people are going to be uncomfortable. You have Joe Biden and his cabinet and people at the highest level of governments had to have had enormous top shelf level conversations and meetings to, to strategically plan out the destruction of America. How do I know this? Well, on day one of Joe Biden's office, he signed 94 executive orders. All 94 were to destroy the border that Trump just gave him. He took away everything that was working. And in one day, one day, signed enough paperwork to destroy the border. That didn't happen on day one. That happened weeks and months before. They had high-level meetings to make decisions on what is going to happen with the border. Listen. You want, I'm going to give you three quotes, okay? Almost to a word. We are going to fundamentally transform America. That's the first quote. Second quote, we are going to have unrelenting waves of immigration into America that is going to make the Anglo-Saxon citizen a minority in their own country. And the last quote, we need illegal aliens to replace the workforce in America. The first quote was President Obama. The second quote was Vice President Joe Biden, and the third quote was Chuck Sumer. Three of the top Democrats told you exactly what they're doing. And now you are watching them do it. And then you're questioning, is it actually happening? You don't have to guess. These are not theoreticals. I want, I want your audience to fact check everything I'm saying, because everything I'm saying is actually and factually true. It's not my data. It's not even my assumptions. This is what is happening. And it's happening to America at a rapid rate. I just, I'm doing this documentary. This is treason.com. I'm going to New York. I've gone to New York. My biggest concern, 
So then I found, uh, I said, well, you know what? I need to gather up some more evidence. And uh, so let's, uh, let's look at this tweet from Colonel Douglas McGregor. <clears throat> Action alert. Non-citizens caught voting in U.S. elections. Here's how they did it. El Eloy Alberto Zayas dash barrier was among the 125,000 Cubans who arrived in the U.S. during the um, Mario boat lift in 1980, which included individuals such as criminals and mental hospital patients. Since then, he has been trapped in a peculiar legal limbo. Unable to qualify for U.S. citizenship with the Cuba refusing to repatriate him, he remains in the U.S. under parole status, lacking full legal protections and unable to obtain a green, hard, green card. Despite his non-citizen status, he participated in early voting in North Carolina on November 5, 2016. He registered as a voter, claimed citizenship, and cast a ballot on the same day. The registered Democrats outnumbered the Republicans by three to one ratio. Partisan politics may play a role in the registration. You think? <laughs> I mean, Doug always tries to be so, you know, politically correct. I don't have to be. I can be, I can be an ad. Hey, by the way, YouTube has a, uh, uh, they got a new feature. Maybe it's not new. It's just new to me where you can specify your pronoun. And I thought, well, you know, I've always wanted my pronoun to be asshole. So what do you think? Should I put put my pronoun as a-hole up there? I mean, do you think that would be appropriate or that probably get me banned from YouTube for life? I don't know. I thought it'd be pretty funny, but anyway, maybe not. So here's the next thing that we go into on how the Democrats are cheating on the election. Wisconsin to see return of ballot drop boxes following Supreme Court decision. Now, I don't even know how this is constitutional. The legislature determines who can vote and who can't. And the legislature already said that they were only going to accept, well, I'll, I'll read you the whole thing. After Donald Trump's narrow loss in 2020, conservatives then who controlled the Wisconsin Supreme Court, oh, it was the Supreme Court, they banned drop boxes. The liberals who now control the court reversed that decision. Do you see how blatant it is in your face? Now, a lot of people, they tell me, well, it's the Uniparty. You know, Mitch McConnell's a Democrat. Yeah, he is. Mitt Romney's a Democrat. Yes, he is. There's a lot of bad Republicans up on Capitol Hill. But there are a few good ones. There are no good Democrats. None whatsoever. And it's in your face. Why in the world would you overturn this decision unless you plan to cheat in the election? Do you see how obvious it is? And the Democrats just throw it out there. They're like, eh, we're going to cheat. And here you go. This is how we're going to do it. Unbelievable. On Friday, Wisconsin's liberal justices on the Supreme Court paved the path for the retirement of absentee ballot drop boxes, altering voting rules just four months ahead of the presidential election. The decision marks a reversal of a previous ruling made two years ago by the conservative-controlled court. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So the, uh, the next story I wanted to get into was, uh, I don't know if you knew, but Orban, uh, Viktor Orban, he's president of, um, of Hungary. And by the way, if you didn't know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of uh, Hungarians that live in western Ukraine. So uh, Hungary has a real interest in, in getting peace or getting those Hungarians out of Ukraine. And they certainly don't want them sent to the front lines. And I bet they're being gathered up by the Azov or the Nazis. And they're probably being sent to the front lines in great numbers. And so that's a big concern for Hungary. So Orban took it upon himself. If you didn't know, he's leading the European Council now. That rotates, and he was next up in line. Boy, I bet they're choking on that. But uh, the globalists are. But anyway, so he went to uh, Zelensky. And uh, I love Alex Kristoff. you got to watch uh, the Duran or, uh, or his channel. Both of them, uh, Alexander and Alex, have their own channels. But anyway, he was saying, well... Orban didn't hug Zelensky, so therefore he didn't get the Zelensky curse. <laughs> if you didn't know, the Zelensky curse, as he calls it. Seems like every leader that hugs uh, uh, Zelensky uh, falls out of power. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's just funny. It's a funny thing. But anyway, I wanted to, um, I didn't get any clips from his visit to uh, Ukraine, but this is, he, from there he went to Russia. 
and he's meeting with Vladimir Putin. And so what I put together was a series of clips. Uh, actually, RT put them together. I just combined them all. And, I, and I'm going to go ahead and show you back to back to back all of those clips together. Now, the video is going to jump around. There's a lot of editing in, the, in these clips because what they did to, to offer translation into various languages is they would speak and then there'd be a pause for, you know, a minute uh, where it's silence, nothing but silence. And while the, you know, then the translator would give the translation, then they'd speak again, and then there'd be a pause, and then the translator would you know, give the translation. So I cut out all of those dead spots. So if you see the clip just kind of jumping, yes, it's heavily edited. But I didn't edit out, edit out anything that the translator said. I just edited out the dead spaces, okay? So don't think I've changed the, the context of, of what these clips are. So let's watch that now. And I must say that there are very few countries now that can talk to both sides of the conflict. And probably Hungary is soon going to be the only country in Europe capable of speaking to both sides. And of course, we'll talk about prospects of developing the, the biggest European crisis in, in Ukraine. Just recently, on the 2nd of July, I believe, you were in Kiev. And now you have come here to Moscow to discuss all the aspects of the situation currently developing there. So I'm at, at your service and you probably know about my speech in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that I delivered recently, stating our position regarding the possible settlement of the situation. And of course, I'm ready to discuss with you any nuances and... Well, I expect you to familiarize me with the position of our European partners, including the conflict in Ukraine. We talked about possible ways of settling it. Prime Minister told us about his recent meetings in Kiev, where he proposed a number of ideas and initiatives, including the proposition to cease fire to start peace negotiations with Russia. As for Russia, I have said repeatedly that we have always been open for discussion for political and diplomatical settlement of the issue. Today was my 11th meeting with the President of Russia. What makes this meeting special is the fact that it is held at times of war, in time when Europe desperately needs peace. For Europe, peace is the most important. Our main task for the next six months of our chairmanship, we see campaigning for peace. I told Mr. President that Europe's biggest development took place in decades of peace. And now we in Europe have been living in the shade of a war for two and a half years. And this causes huge difficulties in Europe. We can't feel safe. We see images of destruction and suffering. And this war has started to have an effect on our economy and competitiveness. Over the last two and a half years, we have realized that without diplomacy, without channels of communication, we won't be able to achieve peace. The world will not come by itself. We need to work towards it and ways of achieving peace is exactly what we have been discussing today with Mr. President. I wanted to see which path would be the shortest towards the end of the war. I wanted to hear, and I did hear, Mr. President's opinion on three important matters. What he thinks about the current peace initiatives on table, what he thinks about a possible ceasefire and peace negotiations in what sequence they could be held. And the third matter I wanted to hear is his vision of Europe after the war. I am grateful to Mr. President for a frank and open negoti negotiation. And our peace initiatives were laid down quite recently during my meeting with the management of the, with the leaders of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. And implementation of this initiative, as we think, would allow us to stop the hostilities 
and start negotiations. And it shouldn't be just a truce or a ceasefire. It shouldn't be just a pause that the Kiev regime could use to restock, to regroup and rearm its troops. Russia stands for a complete and final settlement of the conflict. And if they have to cancel the martial law, then they will have to hold elections. Elections that never happened on time. However, the chances of winning this election are close to zero for Ukrainian rulers who have lost their credit of trust and ratings. Of course, we had a very constructive and frank exchange of opinions on topical international matters. However, from the opposite side, side we've been hearing about unwillingness to solve the matter in this way. And Ukraine's sponsors continue to try to use this country and its people as a ram, as a sacrifice against Russia. As we see it, the situation, considering the facts that we have heard today from Mr. Prime Minister, Kiev is still unwilling to give up the idea of fighting the war till the very end. In my view, the very thought of stopping the hostilities, the Kiev regime cannot admit because this eliminates the pretext to maintain military situation in the country okay so that's that's kind of the summary so i mean at least somebody sat down and talked to the russians and i'm telling you if if you know if the democrats weren't such warmongering totalitarian lunatics you know we could have a conversation with russia now we if we don't agree i'll let the ukrainians keep dying at two thousand a day i mean i guess that's what the the, the biden and the democrats want anyway they want to see all the ukrainians dead they're freaking bloodthirsty lunatics. Of course, you got Lindsey Graham in that category. There's, like I said, there are bad Republicans. And I. everybody wants to pick on me and they say, well, you know, it's the Uniparty. They're all bad. Not all Republicans are bad. Quite a few of them are. Okay, let's just keep going. Now we'll just get into the rest of the news. Uh, this was Mark uh, Kirsten. And uh, he said, uh, I've seen a video of a girl in Gaza with her jaw blown off. How can we be the same after this? How can we tolerate a status quo that murders children? What's left of our shared humanity if we refuse to punish those who slaughter kids because of immunity offered by our leaders? Yeah, we got satanic and demonic uh, leaders. That's the only explanation that I can give you. Otherwise, how, how can you tolerate this, this uh, genocide that's taking place in Gaza? Well, I know Democrats do, because most Democrats, you know, they, well, I'd, I won't say it. I wouldn't say it. They're, they're vacuous meat puppets, or they're authoritarians, or they are demonic and satanic. And I did a video on that. Go back and watch it. I talk, talk about what a Democrat is. Okay. Um, then, of course, this, was, uh, this came out from Europe. Orban does not represent NATO in Moscow, but only his country. That's from Stolenberg. That's his quote. The hysteria around Orban's visit is kind of weird. What are they afraid of? That's Lord Bebo. Well, I'd, let's uh, let's watch a clip about Vladimir Putin says he supports Donald Trump's plan to end the war in Ukraine. Says Trump has not detailed how he intends to end the war, but he supports the idea. Watch. Well, here's the video. Well, you know, the fact that... Mr. Trump, as a presidential candidate, says that he's ready and wants to stop the war in Ukraine. We take that very seriously. Well, I, I haven't seen his ideas on how exactly he's going to do that. And that is the key question. But I have no doubt that he says that sincerely, and we support that. Okay. So there you go. Uh, this is interesting. Russia prepares to sell P-800 Onyx supersonic missiles to the Houthis. This is in response to the sale of Atakums and Scalp uh, Storm Shadow to Ukraine.
Putin stated that he will now be able to arm the enemies of the West, just as they did with the attack of some scalp storm shadow, which were donated to Ukraine and used against Russia. So according to Newsweek, Russia is preparing to sell P-800 Onyx hypersonic missiles to the Houthis. This, material, this materializes the threat of sinking U.S. Navy and Western ships located in the Red Sea. At 2.6, that can't be right. The, uh, it must be 2.6 thousand miles an hour, that just says MPH. These missiles are virtually unstoppable and unshootable, even by the latest uh, U.S. defense systems. The missile is intended for the development of the Bakhmas missile system. It has a thruster engine that gives it a speed of up to 2.6, and it says MPH, and I, that must be 2.6 thousand miles an hour or something like that, and a range of up to 600 kilometers. In this version, intended for Russia. So, I got a clip, uh, this is a, a Hootie video. They don't even have the missiles yet, but yet they're able to hit tankers. There you go. So I, I just thought I'd throw that video in there. Uh, let's keep going. Keeping going with the news. Starting two hours ago, Hezbollah launched a... This was yesterday, actually. I, I just bookmarked it. So yesterday, uh, Hezbollah launched a huge wave of attacks on Israel. The entire occupied Golan Heights was under fire from hundreds of Hezbollah missiles. Dozens of settlements along the border, including the city of Nahariya, were hit by suicide drones. Hezbollah's official statement, in support of the Palestinian people in Gaza and in response to the Israel assassination of our commander Haji Abu Nima, we targeted over 200 missiles. And then these, boy, these are the targets they hit. I'm just going to read those to you. I won't read the rest of the tweet. Headquarters of the IDF 7th Arbor Brigade located in the Kasivika barracks. Headquarters of the Armored Battalion of the IDF 7th Brigade, located in the Gamla Barracks. Headquarters of the IDF's 210th Golai Division, located in Nafa Military Base. Headquarters of the Artillery Regiment of the IDF's 210th Division, in Yarden Barracks. You know what's amazing is the, how in the hell do they, I mean, imagine the intelligence. That they know exactly what they hit and who's located there. I mean, that means they know. I mean, if they can detail in this much detail the targets that they're striking, that's damn good intelligence, man. Let's just keep going. Headquarters of the IDF's 91st Division, located in Ailet Barracks. Headquarters of the IDF's 7th Armored Brigade in the Kastiva Barracks. Headquarters of the IDF's Northern Command. Man, they hit a lot of targets here, didn't they? Holy shit. In the Dayu Military Base, the IDF's Intelligence Base for the Northern Region in Misharm. Headquarters of the IDF's 810th Herman Brigade in the Mali Gulani Barracks, the permanent main base of the IDF's 146th Ilani, Alania Division, headquarters of the IDF's Gulani Brigade, Agos Unit Sarga Barracks. Boy, that's a long tweet. Sorry about that. Uh, Putin at the SCO summit in Kazakhstan said that they are taking Trump's proposal. Yeah, well, we already talked about that. Okay, got cut that up. Uh, for the first time, the Ministry of Defense showed footage of the combat operation of the newest S-350 Vitjets air defense system and the Panstir S-1 air defense systems repelling enemy attacks in the Donetsk direction. The main difference between the Vitjets and the previous system is the number of missiles. One of the launchers is equipped with the same amount of ammunition as the S-300 division. Five launchers can operate with one radar station. The complex supports the simultaneous operation of three stations, which triples the number of missiles on combat duty, allowing you to repel a massive missile attacks. Now, the reason I read all that to you was I just wanted to talk about Russia keeps advancing, man. They are coming up with new weapons, new whole systems, new missiles. I mean, good God, we've turned the Russian bear into a freaking grizzly, man. <laughs> they might have been a black bear before, but they're a grizzly bear now. Holy shit. Uh, so anyway, so here's an 18-year-old charged with a felony for doing donuts on a Pride Street 
mural. Can you imagine that? I mean, he did some donuts, but, but because it was a Pride Street, uh, he's charged with a felony. Oh, my God. All right, so we already talked about the anti-ship missiles going to Yemen. Let's, uh, let's end the video right there. We're going to watch a little bit of Russian hardware. Peace out. Stay free. Say hi to the boo dog.